Okay, so today what I'd like to do is focus on the particles that are shooting out of the nucleus. We want to learn about how fast they're moving, how much energy they carry, and what kind of damage they can do to us. We'd also like to know how we can protect ourselves against these particles. I don't know if you realize, but it's these particles that are shooting out that makes radioactive things dangerous to the human body. Okay, so here's a radioactive man toy. And you can see it says, caution, cardboard does not protect against radioactivity. Well, that statement might be humorous to imagine on a radioactive toy, but cardboard might be able to protect you depending on the type of radiation. So this visual is very helpful and I'd like you to draw this into your notes. It shows you that just a thin layer of paper is enough to stop an alpha particle. A beta particle, on the other hand, is likely to go right through paper, but could probably be stopped by the human body. A gamma particle could pass through paper, possibly the entire human body, and possibly a quite a bit of concrete too before it is stopped. Now realize, why are these particles able to make it through a solid? It's because solids are made of atoms which are mostly empty space. So even though it's paper and you might think it's a solid, there are empty spaces. And if the particles line up right, they could pass right through the paper. With beta being so small, it's very likely to make it through. With alpha being larger, it could make it through, but the chances are relatively small of a single alpha particle making it through a sheet of paper. Okay, so this is how the different types of radiation can be blocked or passed through a material. Graphically, it's nice to plot out something like this. You'll get different graphs depending on what type of radiation it is. And you'll get different graphs depending on what the material is that you're making it out of. But in general, you'll get a graph that looks something like this. This number would represent how many particles would make it through if there was no shield trying to stop the radiation. That's like your original amount. So here it's around 280. Okay, you'll notice that the thicker I make my barrier, the lower the odds of the radiation making it through. If you take a look at where you start, and you cut it in half, so you block half of the radiation, this is called the half value layer. That's the distance, the thickness required to knock out half the radiation. Notice it's around 10 millimeters for this thing. Notice when you go to 20 millimeters, you don't knock out the other half. You only knock out half of what was left. So each time you add another 10 centimeters, you knock off another half of the radiation. You'll never get it down to zero. You just make it less and less likely that the particles will make it through. So for gamma radiation, and again, we talked about how it's different for each type, gamma being the hardest to stop, this is how thick you need different materials to stop half of the original gamma. So for instance, with air, you would need about 62 meters of air to block half of the gamma. Water, you'd need about 71 centimeters, I'm sorry, 71 millimeters. Concrete, you'd need about 44 millimeters. And then lead, you'd only need about 4.8. Lead is a very common material that we're going to use to block radiation. Now you'll notice there's things like uranium that block even better than lead 
but uranium is a source of radiation too. So it doesn't really make much sense to block it when the thing you're blocking it with is producing more. Okay? So what does this mean? Let's say if you had no shielding, a hundred particles were hitting you per second. If you had put a half value layer, that would mean 4.8 millimeters of lead or 12.7 millimeters of steel, only half of that radiation would get through. Okay? If you had two, it would cut it in half again. Three cuts it in half again. Four, it cuts it in half again. So if you did four times this number, it would tell you how much lead you need to get the radiation down to only 6.25 counts per second. At some point, you're going to get the counts less than one per second. That doesn't mean you stopped all the radiation. It means you'll, you'll get hit by less than one particle per second. So one second you might not get hit with any, the next second you might. Okay? It is impossible to get it down to zero. This is at the University of Pennsylvania. They have a um, radiation physics laboratory to feed the hospitals in the city. And when they have a radioactive substance, they will put it in something that looks like a coffee can with a very thick layer of lead. Again, they're using the lead because it's got a really good chance of stopping the particles. It makes it safer for the people who are transferring the radiation from the laboratory to the hospital where it's going to be used. Okay, in addition to the types of radiation we've already learned about, the alpha, the beta, and the gamma, there was another type that was discovered. And this is not a real new type, but it's another particle that's coming out of the nucleus that we didn't really know about. And these are called neutrinos. And the neutrino is something that happens during beta radiation. When we were looking at beta radiation and we saw a neutron turn into a proton with an electron coming off, people realized that even though things were conserved that were supposed to be conserved, things like charge, nucleon number, what wasn't conserved was the spin. So they thought that there was some other particle that was carrying off some of the um, spin from the original substance. And that particle we call our neutrino. Now neutrinos are extremely light. They are incredibly hard to detect. And when we look at the half value layer for neutrinos, if you want to stop half the neutrinos that were coming towards you, you would need one light year of lead. So these neutrinos are incredibly hard to stop. They pass through normal objects undeterred almost 100% of the time. Okay, so these neutrinos again, they come off of all these radioactive substances involving beta positive and beta negative, but they are extremely hard to stop. We built neutrino detectors deep underground and we fill them with water and we have lots of sensors all around looking for the energy signature of the neutrino. We build these underground so that the earth itself can block all the other types of radiation and the only thing that could penetrate to this depth would be the neutrino. Okay, the final thing I want you to realize is everything we talked about in terms of how penetrating these different particles are is true, but it is also dependent upon how much energy these particles have. So not all alpha particles are gonna be stopped in the same way. I talked about a general average value. To see a specific alpha particle and figure out how much energy it has, you start by writing the equation like we did yesterday for the decay of your substance. 
So we start with polonium-210. It gives off an alpha particle and turns into lead-206. Our goal is to figure out how much energy this has. That's going to determine how much damage it's going to do when it hits us, and it's also going to determine how hard it's going to be to stop it. Okay, so how do we find that energy? Well, you start with polonium-210. You look up its mass on your isotope sheet. Remember, these masses are for um, the specific isotope, and they're in AMU. Don't get the mass off the periodic table. All polonium isotopes have different masses. The number on your periodic table is an average. All right, so get the mass from your isotope sheet, and that's the mass you start with. Then you look up the mass of the particles you finish with. So we've got a helium nucleus, and we've got a lead nucleus. So we write down those two masses. Starting mass, ending masses. You then sum up the masses at the end. And you'll notice they do not equal what you started with. You've lost mass. This seems to violate conservation of mass because it does. I taught you at the beginning of this unit that conservation of mass no longer works. That Einstein showed us that mass could disappear from the universe and be replaced by energy. So you subtract these two masses. Your answer will come up in AMU. You convert it from AMU to kilograms. And then you put it in to your E equals MC squared. When you get your answer, that answer will be in joules. It's okay to leave it in joules now, okay? And then in fact, you wanna take that number in joules and use that as the energy of this alpha particle. Now realize it's not quite the energy of the alpha particle because this nucleus will recoil backwards as the alpha particle shoots forward, but it will carry off a very small amount of the energy. The bigger the nucleus you start with, the greater percentage the alpha particle will have of the total kinetic energy. We're gonna assume it gets all the kinetic energy just to make things easy. And that's a pretty good assumption for large particles. And what you're going to do is take the kinetic energy from here. You're going to plug it in here. The mass, you're going to use the mass of the alpha particle. Don't use it in AMU. Convert it over in the kilograms. And then solve for the speed of this particle. Again, the higher the speed, the more penetrating it will be. And the harder it will be to stop it. All right? So I wanna make sure you know how to do this process. Again, it's very similar to what we did before. You find the mass at the beginning, the mass at the end, you subtract, you put it in kilograms, you find the energy, and now we use the energy to find the speed. Higher speeds are more damaging. All right, that's all I wanted to talk to you about today.